Welcome back, Internet. So today, I decided to talk through a specific vulnerability that was um, established or promoted slash published by Trail of Bits. So this vulnerability is related to zero knowledge proofs, and um, that's part of the series. And as I've realized going through the series, or at least reading through all the different blog posts and trying to digest and consume as much as possible, um, it is it, it gets hard fast. There's a lot of mathematics, a lot of formulas, and a lot of really difficult content to to grok. So hopefully this series lasts more than two videos. But if it doesn't, we're still going to do security stuff related to Web3 or crypto, however you want to call it. Um, anywho, so today's vulnerability is called Frozen Heart. And to get an interesting backstory on how this vulnerability came about, there's a podcast that um, Trey Levitz put out. And in the podcast, they specifically talk through um, this individual, I'm not sure his name, Jim maybe, or Matt? Probably Matt, yeah. Um, or both, I don't know. So I think Matt went to a conference, and at the conference, they heard a talk in relation to a Swiss voting system that had a specific vulnerability within it. And that vulnerability um, then brought him to think more about specific types of uh, schemes underlying cryptography within zero knowledge proofs in a variety of other places. And through that thought process and through some research, they found a series of vulnerabilities and a series of zero knowledge proofs, which actually then came to the creation of this, this uh, resource. So ZK Docs, and I'm not sure if I have it linked here. I definitely have it linked somewhere. Um, let's do it. Let's go here. Cause I, I want to show you these. This is probably pretty important for me to show. Uh, let's do ZK Docs. There we go. So what they've created is basically a guide to walk through some of the more prominent vulnerabilities they've discovered in relation to zero knowledge proofs. Um, and we'll get into why that's the case and things like that. But just for those that are trying to develop you know, zero knowledge proofs and trying to put those into production, it's good to walk through here and make sure that the implementation of the scheme itself is done correctly. And you're considering all of the potential faults both in the paper and your implementation. So what they've done here is they have an interactive guide where you walk through this, you can actually adjust different variables. And as you adjust those, um, it'll adjust these. So you can add numbers and you can see how oh, that didn't do anything. Maybe here. There we go. So you can see that it adjusts the numbers and it kind of gives you the reflection of what those are. And you can see that two has been adjusted everywhere where wherever whatever that was was there. Um, and you can reset the variables as well. So the intent of this is basically to ensure that you understand where everything sits within the formula and how that can change. Um, so this is an interesting guide for implementation of certain schemes. There's not tons in here, um, but there's enough in here for some of the more prominent schemes. So that's kind of the background as to how I came to come across this vulnerability and, and why I decided to pursue it, because there's a lot of um, good that comes from the work that Trail of Bits has done here. So that being stated, um, I'm going to walk you through my notes. So these are more thought through notes. And these notes are actually, as many of you asked, in GitHub. So I've had a lot of people comment below, can you share the notes? And I've never shared them. Um, the reason I never shared them is because I never had a mechanism to do so. So what I've done is I've basically taken the markdown from Obsidian and I put it inside of GitHub. So now you can actually see all the notes that I have and you can see all the links that I have as well. So it's also going to help me with the YouTube description too, which is nice. So in here, you're going to have everything that I have in my notes I'm going to walk you through. And there's all the links as well that walk you through um, different sources that I've used and things that I found useful. So that being stated, our outline is very simple. So we're going to do a TLDR. So if you listen to nothing else, if you listen to probably that three minutes of me talking, you'll get the gist or into it as to what this vulnerability is and why it's important. Um, we'll talk through some prerequisites of things that you should probably know or understand. Let me zoom in here so you can see it. Uh, there we go. Some prerequisites of things that you should probably understand to grok the vulnerability in a, in a deeper level. And then also we're going to walk through each of the protocols that were impacted. And there is probably more that were impacted, but these are the three main ones that uh, Trailer Bits discussed in their blog series. So um, interrupting your regularly viewed programming, or however they said it back in the day, I forgot to mention in this video that I have a newsletter. And the newsletter is called D Squared Musings. So if you'd like to subscribe, I'll keep the uh, subscribe link inside of the description for most of the videos going forward. And also all of the newsletters that I've written and created will be inside of the website that I have. And it'll be housed there. So there'll be a large archive in the future of all the newsletters I've published. This is a weekly newsletter every Friday that talks about three main sections. So first is crypto security. So things I found in relation to that field that I found useful or interesting. 
Another was education. So this could relate to crypto security. It could relate to zero knowledge proofs. It could relate to general technology. And the last is miscellaneous. So random things I come across that I find interesting that I think is either entertaining, useful, whatever else. Um, so if you're interested in subscribing, the description will have the link. Um, and also, it, uh, like I said, I'll have an archive in here that you can find. So with that being stated, back to Ether Dylan. All right, TLDR. In the TLDR section, there's a series of things that I've written out, and they kind of hopefully progress towards understanding what the vulnerability is about. So first things first is recommended reading. If you read nothing from the blog series you've created, I recommend reading the introductory um, post. So this is the introductory post that walks you through kind of the high level intuitive understanding of what this vulnerability is, why it's important, and how it impacts certain protocols. And then after this, there's a series of other um, posts. So if you scroll through here, I'm not sure if they've listed them out or not. Let's do plunk. So they should be, they should be linked in here, but if they're not, then they're definitely linked below in my notes. So if you go in my notes and you scroll through here, you'll see, hopefully I don't make you sick. Just close your eyes. Um, there is different sections. So this section is the Geralt proof. And if you go here, it's going to be the first post of the post of the series of four posts. So the first post I showed you here, which is not this one, is um, was the coordinated one. So let's do actually, this might be helpful trail of bits. You can you can see that I was super prepared, right? Internet. Hope you're impressed. Okay, cool. This is going to help. So in here, there's a catalog of zero knowledge articles that um, trail of bits have written. The ones that I'm referring to in this specific conversation is going to be these four here. So I can't highlight all three of them, but it's uh, coordinated disclosure, a frozen heart vulnerability for Gerald's proof, bulletproofs, and Plonk. So these four articles are all related to that series, and they're all relating back to the vulnerability we're going to discuss here, which is the frozen heart vulnerability. And with that very first one, like I said, I recommend you read this one. If you read none of the other four, that's fine. But you'll at least get an understanding of what the vulnerability is here and some links that will help you understand it better as well. All right, let's go back to the notes. Where were we? Here. All right. Uh, TLDR. Where'd you go? It's so big for me. All right, cool. So recommended reading that post. Next part is frozen heart. So why do they specifically call it frozen heart? Well, you can see here they're specifying um, the frozen portion is an acronym, which is more like a backronym probably. And it's really talking through the, the crux of what's being exploited, where you can see they're forging of zero knowledge. And then the heart is referring to uh, Fiat Shamir, which is the transform that turns an interactive proof to a non-interactive proof, and we'll talk more about that later. And then this transform sits at the heart of most um, zero-knowledge proof systems. Most, and I, I'm not sure if this is the case anymore, and this is probably another side note, I've realized that when reading so much content in relation to this, if I reflect on past videos, like the first video I created, I can see how ignorant I was on a series of topics, and also how many things I probably got incorrect. So just know, take everything I say here with, this, with a grain of salt because I'm learning along with you and I'm probably gonna get some stuff wrong. And with that being stated, I think this um, Fiat Shamir transform still sits at the heart of some systems, but I'm not sure if that's the case for SNARKs um, or new variants of implementations of SNARKs that are being used today um, in production for specifically ZK rollups. Um, so we'll find out more when we make videos about that stuff. Long story short, they're saying that this sits at the heart of a lot of many, many different systems. So you can see that's why they've called it a uh, frozen heart. And also a bit of a plug for myself. Look at this artwork right here. I made this through Dolly too. You know, very impressive. Very excited that I can make pretty art now with just word prompts. All right, so that's the acronym. That's what it stands for. The next piece here is the exploit. So here you can see the main exploit or the main issue for the exploit is specifically incorrect implementations of the Fiat transform, um, the Fiat Shamir transform. They sum it up well here, and they really talk through two things that are implemented incorrectly. So first off, it really comes down to public values and what public values are included in the hash computation of the Fiat uh, Shamir uh, scheme. And you can see here that they state that it's really important for you to include um, the zero knowledge proof statements as well as all the public values computed in the proof itself. Um, and one example they gave here was the commitment values um, that the prover, I think, generates. So long story short, 
whenever creating or implementing a fiat shamir transform always include any of the public values um, within the proof statement itself or the values computed the public values computed from the proof that's kind of the the key of this vulnerability when people actually don't do that they leave some public values out when they leave public values out when hashing that computation via um, fiat shamir uh, that it opens them up to a potential forgery of a proof um, via the prover so the next piece here talks through um, the same point I made already. Uh, ah, so the fix here is basically I've already stated this. So including, making sure you include all the public values from the proof statement as well as the computed proof. If you include all those, there's a higher chance that you won't necessarily allow the prover to forge proofs in a fake way to then trick the verifier. Um, so why is this happening? This is quite interesting. So Trailabit stated that the reason this is happening is two reasons. First off, there's vague descriptions in many of the papers that people are implementing, and also there's a lack of guidance in the papers that people are implementing. So that then leads to a vulnerability. And I think it's the second protocol, Bulletproofs, where in the paper, they explicitly stated the wrong implementation and directed those that were implementing the paper um, in, a, in a more dangerous fashion. I know all of this stuff has likely been fixed by now. I think most of it has. And all the papers that have been um, incorrect have been corrected by the authors, which is great. And they've done it in a really fast way. So that's really awesome. But this shows you exactly why this has happened and why it's happening, um, why it's so prevalent within the zero knowledge implementation ecosystem and why it's a concern for trailer bits. And it's, it's also why they've created this entire blog series and all the useful um, ZK docs they've created that are associated to it. And then last thing here is uh, the quote from Trello Bits, basically expanding uh, along the formula I've jotted out here, where you can see it really comes down to a combination of ambiguous descriptions from the authors in the papers, and also a general lack of guidance from those um, authors in those papers that are then incorporated into these protocols. And we'll see some examples later on. These are the, this is the TLDR, like I stated. So if you want to hear nothing else, that's fine. Go on, do your thing. But if you want to stick around and learn more about the specific implementations that have failed, why they failed, etc., let's, uh, let's do this. So prerequisites. It's really important for us to understand, or at least get a, a general understanding of what in the hell Fiat Shamir Transform actually is. What does this function do? What is its purpose? Because if this sits at the heart of everything, this is the vulnerability, you probably have an understanding of what it does. Um, so some prerequisites I put here prior to actually talking through this are some things I've discussed previously. So in the previous video, we talked about the three main ingredients of a zero knowledge proof. Those three main ingredients are completeness, soundness, and zero knowledgeness. Completeness refers to the fact that the statement is true. Um, then the prover can convince the verifier. So it's basically saying that the proof itself is complete and there is a true statement there and it's not false. The soundness here is actually what's vulnerable, what's being exploited. And the soundness really refers to the fact that the prover is unable to forge or uh, fake a proof to a verifier and false, like falsify a statement. And this really comes down to one of two things. So the soundness of the proof itself and also a number of iterations depending on the type of proof you're looking at. So the iterations point is around um, if you have a verifier and a prover, so you have a verifier and a prover, and they're interacting back and forth. If they interact on an iterate, iterative basis and they do this, you know, a thousand times, the prover has a lower probability of falsifying a, a proof to the verifier if they, you know, instead of doing it a thousand times, they do it, you know, a million times. And that increases the probability that this is a truer statement, so the soundness is, is, is stronger. And also this is, all I think in SNARKs, this is called an argument of knowledge. So it's basically a, a solidified version of the argument. So long story short, that's what the soundness stands for. And zero knowledgeness basically refers to the fact that this uh, leaks no information in relation to specifically I've, I've seen people talk about the concept of a witness for the prover so for now you can kind of ignore that because that'll be a separate topic for prover witness um, but this is basically stating that zero knowledge is leaked from the uh, exchange between the verifier and the prover or the proof itself all right so those are the three elements that we need to discuss let's first now let's go to the fiat shamir piece in here, the introductory article, so there's another introductory article that I clicked on on accident that's talking about serving up zero knowledge. And this is probably, I kind of wish I would have come across this previously for the first video because they've actually done a pretty good job at explaining 
um, how zero knowledge proofs function interact in an interactive way and also a non-interactive way for a layman. So someone that's new to this field or new to this topic. And in this example, um, I'm going to scroll through this pretty quickly. They talk through tennis. So tennis is the example here. And in this example, this is the interactive example. So we have a verifier over here. Let's do yellow because you can see that. And then we have a uh, prover over here. Now the prover and the verifier are playing tennis back and forth. And the proof here is basically to prove the fact that the prover themselves, they're good. And I don't know if you can see, you might not be able to see yellow on green. So let's do black on green. So we want to prove that the prover is good at tennis. To do that, the verifier, what they're going to do is they're going to hit the ball back and forth, and they're going to hit the ball back and forth at a specific speed, at a specific spin, and in a specific location. And when they hit that ball to the prover, their expectation is that the prover not only hits the ball back, but they hit the ball back to a specific target. And that specific target is basically showing that if the prover can hit the ball back at a specific target every single time, then that means that they are quote unquote good at tennis. And that correlates back to a proof within the zero knowledge proof exchange that proves that they are sending back a complete and a sound proof to the verifier. Now, the next piece here is turning this into a non-interactive proof because currently what we have is we have a lot of back and forth. So we have two quote unquote humans back and forth hitting the ball. And like we said in the previous video, within blockchain, most of the time you're gonna run into non-interactive proofs because that allows scale. It also allows a variety of other reasons as to why people kind of shift towards that. The scale piece is basically showing that the verifying prover are not always going to be online. So we need to ensure that it's not interactive so we can scale this out to a higher, higher proportion of people. So the non-interactive proof here is basically we're going to flip up the verifier and turn it into like a robotic wall. And this robotic wall has a very specific, you know, set of skills and the wall once you hit the ball to the wall the ball is going to come back but it's going to come back like we said previously with a specific speed a specific spin and a specific location and when it hits it back the prover has to hit has to respond back and has to respond to a specific slot if it can do so that means that it, it is yet again a good tennis player slash a good proof now with this specifically this game what we've what's happened here is we've incorporated a fiat shamir um, scheme and the fiat shamir scheme has allowed us to remove the verifier and only have the prover doing the process and they can then send the proof to the verifier later on after they've iterated all through all the proofs they wanted to iterate through so i think that's probably a very basic way of explaining kind of what we're looking at but it's probably one of the best ways to intuit what's happened where we've re removed the human verifier and we put in a robotic wall a robotic um, you know verifier that then verifies back later on once we need to um, some other pieces here that I wanted to talk through or point out. Uh, so we've talked through this. We've talked through the example. Uh, main issue. Okay, so the main issue here, which I think gives more context as to what we're looking at. So this is a screenshot from the blog post if you want to read through it yourself. But what I've done is this is the main screenshot. This is the screenshot that has some edits that will help me know what I want to talk about. So in here, we can see I've highlighted a few things. So first and foremost, the... Fiat Shamir protocol is turning an interactive proof to a non-interactive proof, highlighted here. In this exchange, what's going to happen is the prover generates a random value, such as A, and it computes B by putting A as an exponent of G. So then we have um, a prover generates C, which is a random hash function. So this is italicized, you can see in the blog post, and this is where kind of the vulnerability sits. So what's happening is this prover generates C randomly through a hash function. So randomly through a hash function, this hash function right here refers to the Fiat Shamir scheme. So what we're talking about. So Fiat Shamir basically create, has this really convoluted, amazing hash function that's super strong, preferably. And you're going to hash some value generated randomly um, from the prover. You're going to hash it and they're going to, that hash is what's going to happen. And that's how we remove the um, interactive piece because historically in the interactive process, the prover generated a random value, sent B to the verifier. Verifier then took B as well as some value they had for C randomly and they put that in the function. They sent that back to the prover. The prover then um, does some stuff with Z, sends it back to the verifier, the verifier verifies. So that interactive piece. What we're trying to do with this um, exchange here is remove step two. So ensuring that we no longer have to go to the verifier here, but instead we're just gonna do it as a prover. And that's what's happening with step two. And that's why we're using a hash function instead of using a verifier because we're substituting a verifier for this hash, fun hash function. 
And this hash function, I think, in some cases, is mutually agreed upon by the verifier and the prover prior to actually utilizing it. So they both agree that this is a quality hash function. Um, or in the future, we'll talk about random Oracle models. Cool. So that's the process, what's happening here. Um, and the point that they want to make here is that this hash function um, of just hashing B is considered a weak fiat chimera transform. Reason being is that we're only hashing B. And there may be other variables that are public here that we're not hashing. And if we're doing that, then that's going to allow the prover to potentially forge a fake proof and trick the verifier. So when they go through the process of verifying what proof has been sent to them, they can be, um, they can be duped. And this is discussed further down here. So this is just another example they provided. Oh, here we go. Um, so another example here they provided is a public secret key. So they have a public key, which is this little thing here, I think is considered prime. So it's not the actual public key, but a random public key that the prover created themselves. Um, they then set B to what that is. They then run this hash for C, they do some other stuff. And at the end, if you come down here, you'll see that while just doing this, this function here, they forgot to include the um, public key. So this allows the prover to create a fake public key, which hence this like little dash thing here, I think is considered prime. That's what it stands for, PK prime. And then um, they can set the actual public key to uh, this information that's then you know computed into that. And that's, I think, forged and fake, and that tricks the verifier. And what's happening here is what they point out is that the reason this happens is because this function here is weak and it needs to be stronger. And to make it stronger, we would actually include not only B, but we would also include the public key, the valid public key in there. So when we hash that, it's going to come up with a specific um, hash that has the, the valid information, which makes this proof more sound and more complete, going back to the three things we mentioned earlier. And to make it even stronger, you can add more variables. So instead of just adding the B and the PK, the public key and the, the value that we originally had for B, we can also add another variable and you can just keep adding these variables over and over and making this stronger and stronger as long as all those variables are public and it goes with the scheme that you agreed with previously with the verifier. So that's kind of the overview of Fiat Shamir and how it functions. Um, some other information I have below here, I have some more information on Fiat Shamir, so let's skip down to that for now. Um, so this is another resource that I found useful from Ron. So Ron created, uh, he had a presentation, you know, two presentations at this conference that were, one was way over my head, the second one, the first one was, you know, somewhat understandable. And in this specific uh, conversation, he talks through what Fiat Shamir Transform is, how it functions, and how that actually correlates to another thing called a random oracle model. So I recommend if you do watch this video, I highlighted specifically just watching this introductory portion here from 120 to 11. It gives you an intuitive understanding of what he's talking about. If you want to stick around for the rest, it's useful, um, but it does get pretty, pretty deep, pretty fast. So we can see here um, in the example that Ron provided is we're transitioning once again from interactive to non-interactive, and we're using the fiat transform to do so. And when we transform over, we can see originally we had a prover here and our verifier here, and our prover initially sent alpha one and our um, verifier sent beta one back, and they would just kind of bounce back and forth, sending these back and forth to verify and prove. To prevent that or uh, create a more scalable way of doing this is actually having a hash function. And this hash function, remember, is basically based on the Fiat Shamir transform scheme. This hash function, what we're gonna do here, so instead of sending back and forth alpha one and beta one, we're gonna have the prover create alpha one they're going to then take alpha one and we're going to put that into a hash function. We can add X and a variety of other variables if we'd like. That's just making it stronger as long as they're public. Remember, public. And then we're going to hash that and put it into beta one. So we have beta one. We never longer had, we no longer had to go to the verifier to get that. We were able to create it ourselves because we substituted the verifier for this hash function. So we then keep doing this over and over until we go to whatever BI, however long you want that to be. And then all of this is then sent over to the verifier to verify in the future. And that's kind of the hash function approach. Um, he then talked about for a little bit around the random oracle model. And the random oracle model is still somewhat um, kind of mystical to me. The big thing I wanted to point out here is the random oracle model is, the way you've stated it, it's like a randomized function that sends back data 
but it sounds like for me, it sounds like a lot like a function. You send something to it, it sends something back. And if you send the same thing to it, it sends the same thing back. What the difference is between the two, I'm not sure. So that's why I've just sent this here. I've, I've provided you the presentation. The one thing that stands out, it states that this is uniformly random. So I'm not sure how random this can be corollary to a hash function, depending on the type of hash function. So there's a resource here called, um, uh, so it's a random Oracle model series on part one. I've not read this yet. This is on my to-do list, but I think that this will give some intuitive understanding, at least parts one, because this is an entire series. I'm not sure if you linked all of them here. Yeah, um, no, he didn't, but it's a, it's a five part series around random Oracle models and how specifically this approach to creating a hash function that allows you to replace the verifier specifically for this part of the process is somewhat um, highly debated within the cryptography community. And I'm not sure how utilized this is currently within snarks and CK rollups. So long story short, read this blog post if you want to know more about this, but that is kind of how the Shamir process works. So before we move on to the next piece, I did want to highlight this little beautiful graph I created. And inside of the blog series with Trail of Bits, they talk through specifically how in each of the examples that we walk through in the next couple of minutes, um, the complexity increases in the protocol. And as the complexity increases for each of these protocols, because we have Schnorr, which is talked about originally in the first article, then we have Geralt, which has its own dedicated part, Bulletproofs has its own dedicated part, and Planck has its own dedicated part. And each of these increase in complexity, and the complexity is specifically in, in relation to the number of, um, let's, let's call it SF, so, uh, fam Shiat Famir, I think it was called, I don't know, it's called Shiat. Um, so the, the SF transform, so we talked about this entire time, um, they increase, uh, there's a number of them. So the quantity of SF transforms increase over time. And as they increase over time, that allows for more complexity, which allows for a potential vulnerability that's more severe than it would be if it didn't include um, the uh, more simplified variant. And each of these are in that case. So as we progress through each of these series, we'll see that the complexity of each of these increase and the severity also increases as well. So the three protocols that are discussed here, I've already, I've already kind of laid out. So we'll start with the first one in the series, which is Geralt's proof. And in Geralt's proof, they, it's a bit convoluted around how it's explained because you need to know a bit, a bit of mathematics to understand what's being discussed. And I kind of have a broad understanding we can see the way that this functions, the draw proof, is the prover proves that they know a discrete log of a certain value over a composite modulus. So, you know, discrete log is gobbledygook and composite modulus is gobbledygook for those that are not necessarily within the, within the math community, or at least remember what they did in high school. And I wanted to point out kind of my understanding of what this is. So, the discrete log of a certain value over a composite modulus, the way I understand this is that there's a, a space. And in this space, there's a series of, uh, so let's just say values. So there's a bunch of values in the space. And the prover is basically stating that they know a specific value inside of that space. And they mention that it's composite modulus because the space is finite. There's a limit to this. You can't go outside of this range of values. So what they do in that case for this specific mathematical approach is they have this modulus uh, thing here. This modulus thing here is basically saying this is mod something. So this is mod n, this could be mod four, five, six, whatever you want. And when you have a value that's um, h equals g, this is I think exponent of x mod n, that's basically saying that this value that I have, this secret value is gonna be here and I know what this is. And it's proving the fact that if I know this and you run through this formula and everything is correct, it's it's hard for me to guess it because it's a, it's called a strong back door, I think, or strong trap door. So when you read about RSA and crypto and stuff, they have these things called trap doors. And it's basically something that's really hard to reverse. So traditionally we had a very old school way of doing this and that was um, prime numbers. So you would have you know A and B and you would multiply those and that would equal C. And these two prime numbers would equal this and it would be really hard for you to understand what this and this are um, to reverse it from C. That's not, not really hard, it, you know, it used to be hard back in the day when you didn't have computers that were really big and scary. Um, but now this is slightly easy, so this is considered a weak trapdoor. So a strong trapdoor is when you 
apply some modulus to this and you do some other mathematical trickery to ensure that it's really, really hard to reverse that trapdoor, um, making it a stronger trapdoor. And to understand modulus and kind of the, the space limitations and things like that, I did include an article here from Khan Academy, which talks through specifically what modulo arithmetic is. And there's a lot of references to clocks and things like that. But the premise of this is that when you have a modulus of whatever, um, you can see that this is 8 mod 4 equals, you know, question mark. So what is question mark? So if this is 8 mod 4, we know that the limit here is the 4 for mod. So the mod is mod 4. That means that we have basically a circle. The circle has four points. So we have, we're starting at 0 because it's 0 indexed. So we have 0, 1, 2, 3. So those are four points. What we're going to do is we're going to wrap this around. And the, the question here is saying, how many times do we wrap around? And then also of those, what is the remainder? And we can see here that we're going to wrap around twice. So the answer here should be that if we go once, two, it's going to be zero. And the reason that is is because when we go once, that's four into eight. And then we go once again, that's another four into eight. And we get to eight, so that's going to be zero. That's probably a poor explanation as to what modulo math is. But you should definitely check out that link to learn more about kind of how this functions. And you can see down here the answer is zero. Because we've wrapped around twice and we're sitting at zero. And that's limiting the, um, the, the value uh, the finiteness of the value. So we're saying that we don't want to exceed four in, uh, integers. So we're going to basically wrap around as many times as we have to when we're doing a higher number such as eight or a million mod four equals whatever. So that's kind of the modulus piece for this protocol. Um, I hope that is somewhat insightful. So the example they walk through is called Zengo. So Zengo is an implementation of this specific type of uh, zero knowledge proof. And uh, with here, they basically stated that there's a there's a certain function, and this function is the this, this, this Shamir SF, we'll call it SF. So the SF scheme, the SF scheme basically includes a hash, and the hash includes uh, G, N, and U. But in here, it's actually missing H, which is another variable part of this implementation that's public. And if you look at the code here, uh, if it lets me go to it, um, in the code, it basically brings you right to here, and you can see that this variable here, E, um, entails a digest. So it's, there's a compute digest, which is basically a hash within Rust. And this compute digest is taking in three variables. So we have X, G, and N, and it's missing H. So H is not here. And H, like we said, is a public value. So if H isn't here and it's a public value, that means that our prover is able to leverage this H to create a forged proof. And if they're able to do that, then it's no bueno. So let's go to this here. So we can see that if that's the case, we come down here and this is also another explanation. So inside of the ZK docs, they walk through this protocol and they show you that H isn't included. I've just highlighted it in the screenshot. And the point I wanted to bring to here is that in the article that they, wa they walk through in this blog series, they mentioned that this could potentially not be a big deal. And the reason it's potentially not a big deal goes back to the complexity picture that I created earlier. Remember how we had the arrow and it said, you know, this is complexity, this is less, this is more. So if we're using this protocol in a very kind of minimized way, and we're simply just creating a standalone public key, then like they stated in this, this quote from the trail of it series, this is likely not as severe as it would be if it was in a complex infrastructure, a compl complex application. And then they stated further on that if it was in a larger system, then this could possibly be very severe. And they actually even said that it is likely to be very severe if it sits inside of a larger um, signature scheme. So that's our first example. Our next example is uh, bulletproofs. So in the bulletproof, the way that this functions is we have a prover and the prover basically wants to um, create a secret value. So they, they create a secret value and this secret value lies within a predefined range. This, very, this is kind of similar to the modulo point I made earlier. So we have a predefined range here and then here our prover is basically stating that they know a certain value in that range and they're going to bind themselves to this which is really important to point out. So you can see I've highlighted here binds. What do I mean by binds? Well this is based on a a thing that sits below bulletproof, which is a type of range proof if you're interested, and that, that sits on top of a scheme called the Peterson Commitment Scheme. And in here, there's a really good uh, graphic that I pulled from this source here, which is a blog that talks through a series of proofs, and they do a good job of talking through bulletproofs. So I wanted to kind of give a shout out to them and the image they created. And in this image, we can see that we have two chefs. So we have a tall chef, short chef. And this chef here is basically going, going to commit to a secret value 
that's hidden. So this is the hidden value that they committed to. And the committing piece here is the binding. So this is in the, in the paper, they call it binding. And this is, I think this is called hiding in the paper, maybe. So what they've done is they bind themselves to a specific value and they put this in a treasure chest. They then take this treasure chest and they send the treasure chest off to Little Chef. So Little Chef is the verifier. This is our prover. So the Little Chef takes the chest and he has it. He has it for a little while. So they hold the chef for a little, little long time or how long they want to hold it. And then uh, Big Chef then sends the key to Little Chef. Little Chef then opens the box. And when Little Chef opens the box, they can see the value that the prover committed to previously. And the, the important point around the binding and hiding is to ensure that the prover is committed to a value and they cannot change that. They cannot go back on it. They can't adjust the value. They say, this is what I believe now. And in the future, this is when you open it, I will, I will still be committed and binded to this value. So that's kind of the um, proof, the zero knowledge proofness of that process where we're not showing what the value is. We're just sending it to the verifier and then opening it up when we choose to, um, to then verify that we've committed to this specific value or this specific um, concept. Now, the issue here and the vulnerability lies within the paper itself, which is, I think, quite fascinating, where you can see that I've stated here um, in the blog series that Trailer Bits wrote that the author actually made a mistake in the original paper. And if we scroll down a bit, we'll see a screenshot from, from the post itself from uh, Trailer Bits. And then here you can see that this is a snippet from the original paper. And in the snippet from the original paper, you can see that they mentioned that um, all random challenges are placed by hashes of a transcript up to the point. And they say, for instance, you can do the hash of this, or you can do the hash of this. So the hash here includes A and S, and this includes A, S, and Y. So these are the recommendations from the author for those that are implementing the proof um, to include these variables within the Fiat Shamir transform to make this inter non-interactive for the proof. The issue here is that they're excluding a specific variable V, uh, not just this, but you can see that um, that the statement states that the, this violates our rule of thumb. None of the public values from the statement are included. So apparently in this implementation, none of the public values are included, but they specifically called out V within this explanation because of its importance that lies within this proof. And if they don't include V, then the prover themselves this allows them to create malicious proofs and then um, you know, fool the verifier. And that's where the, um, the vulnerability lies within bulletproofs. And the paper has been corrected and the implementations for ZK docs is available for people that are implementing specifically bulletproofs or variants of it. Uh, this is a resource I found useful. So uh, Dan Bonet is actually a great educator and I've watched probably too many um, hours of him talking about zero knowledge proofs. But this specific presentation here is him talking through bulletproofs because he actually was, I think, a co-author of this paper. And he talks through kind of the benefits of it. And he does a lot of comparisons for proof size and, and proof time and verifying time and stuff like that in accordance to other types of snarks and other types of zero knowledge proof schemes. All right, home stretch. Last one, Planck. So this one's probably pretty quick because Planck is still way over my head um, as well as ZK snarks. And this is probably will be a next video where I dive deep into it to understand it better. Um, but from my intuitive understanding, here's some interesting tidbits that I found and things that I found useful. So Planck itself is a type of ZK snark. And one interesting thing I learned about ZK snarks is from what I've read, some people talk about snarks and uh, uh, sorry, snarks and starks as like completely separate things. Like there's a divider between the two. But I recently realized or learned that Starks are just a subset of Snarks. So they're actually kind of one in the same family. There's not a huge discernment between the two, which is kind of like an interesting thing to realize. Um, and, and Vitalik's post, so Vitalik wrote a blog post on this and a series of other things. And most of Vitalik's posts, no offense, they're amazing. But I think after the first like 25% of reading it, they get really deep, really fast, and they're hard to comprehend and understand. So. And he even admits it in most of his posts saying that this is a really hard thing to grasp. So don't be upset if you don't get it in the first time or the 10th time. Um, it's just a really hard topic and it takes a lot of time to understand both the math behind it, the formulas and everything to understand what's exactly happening. But there's an interesting graph that he created. And this graph uh, shows uh, two spectrums. So I think uh, down here at the bottom is good 
and here is good. So like if you sat here, this would be like the golden, I think the golden goose. No, I'm, I'm a dummy. It should be there. Sorry about that. Um, so you can you can just ignore that. Let's let's do this again. So this here and this here. So this is where you want to sit to get like the perfect uh, the perfect proof with zero trade offs. And what's happening here is they're showing the assumptions that are needed. So the fewer the better assumptions, and also the smaller the proof size, the better. So this is higher proof size, lower proof size, um, more assumptions, less assumptions. So we can see that Planck's sit kind of right in the center, where uh, Planck's have. A pretty good proof size and they have uh, a minimum kind of a pretty good assumption set but Starks sit up here at a higher because they just have hash funks has functions to secure there is no um, there's the the ceremony at the beginning to create a trusted setup they don't need that um, and then snarks are down here so their proof size is super small and then but they do have a pre-programmed trusted setup and some of the other things that come with the assumptions that take time so I thought this is a useful graph just to kind of see how these different things compare. And you can see darks are like bulletproofs similar. Um, some other interesting things inside of the blog post that uh, Vitalik wrote around Planck specifically is that this fancy cryptography, this is a quote from his post, um, is based on a uh, type of commitment called Kate. And this commitment, uh, I think the most interesting thing is down here where it states that um, the scheme itself is compatible with other um, other achievable trade-offs between proof size and security assumptions. So the point here is that you're able to swap out Planck's for other schemes because of the way that Planck's are con configured for the um, math specifically. And it states that you could swap it out for things such as Fry, which means that you could actually change, uh, you could turn Planck into a Stark. So remember, Planck is a type of snark. So what they're saying here is there's a possibility to actually convert a snark into a Stark for certain applications. So say you're using, um, you know, use case one. So use case one is better for snarks. So you use a snark and then you have use case two and you want to use a Stark because of the trade-offs that are being made here. And that for me is really exciting because you can almost kind of not completely ignore the trade-offs, but accept them based off use case instead of just choosing one specific zero knowledge proof scheme and then using that for all the use cases and kind of just accepting the trade-offs as you go on. I think that's quite interesting. Um, another interesting thing I came across was the the ability to share tooling amongst the developers where if people did adopt this scheme that Planck leverages or a variation of it then we can expect and you can see it stated from the quote we can expect rapid progress of improving shared arithmetization, I'm not even sure if that's a word, techniques. So being able to use these specific techniques amongst the developers allows for higher adoption, more um, more composability between different types of uh, proofs and, and schemes and second layers. So, I mean, that's really the, the end goal here, right? Is we have all these proofs and, and the tooling and the documentation is, you know, nil, it's very low and abstracting away from the circuits for snarks and building at a higher level like you know solidity or python as well as having a series of tools that are interchangeable between proofing schemes allows us to actually scale as an ecosystem not just within zero knowledge proofs but within crypto more broadly and i think that's kind of the hope here is for um, this to be adopted along with other um, proof schemes so we can have more standards around how things are built and how they interact uh, here's another table from Dan. So it's another comparison for kind of how things are connected. We can see that on this table, they're comparing a few things. So we have um, the size of the proof, uh, the size of, not sure what that is, but he states it in the presentation, the time, the time to verify and also the trusted setup. So in here, we can see that they have the different options here and uh, bulletproofs are sitting here and then plonks are sitting here. So you can see that Plonks still have trusted setups, and this is something people are trying to get away from, which is some sort of um, ceremony that happens at the beginning where there's a mutually agreed secret that's destroyed, so we can kind of trust the system that does the distribution of um, different things to verifiers and provers. That's a different video, but you can see that um, Plonks sit around here on this graph. And it's another graph or another pro presentation that I recommend uh, checking out. So I may briefly like mention circuits earlier. So the way that snarks function, like I said, is still a mystery to me. And it's something I need to research better. Um, but I intuitively understand there are circuits, similar to how uh, 
we have circuits inside of computers, they have and or gates. Instead of having um, computational circuits, they have arithmetic circuits. We have pluses and, and multiplication and things like that. And that's kind of how Planck functions since Planck is a um, variant of a snark. What I wanted to show here is basically what we're looking at is we have uh, wires and we have circuits. So wires are, you can see from the annotations that I've drawn here, wires are the lines in between the um, different nodes and then the nodes themselves are going to be circuits. Now with these, there are specific um, wires and circuits that are available just to just the prover. So those are gonna be private wires and circuits. And then we have um, public wires and circuits that are available to both the prover and the verifier. So you can see this is starting kind of to get to the vulnerability within Planck. So we can see here is that if we take uh, commitment A and commitment B, we put them into A plus, we have our gate for um, addition and we take commitment C, we times that by C and then out, output our output wire, which comes to a certain value. Now, let's say in this case that A and B are private to our prover and then let's say that C is public to the verifier as well as the prover. Now, if we scroll through here, we'll see that the vulnerability here is actually that specifically there's a failure in the inputs for the verifier. So we're able to include randomized public um, values or public wires into the circuit that then allows us to exploit this and create a forged proof that tricks the verifier. And you can see some of the um, different projects that were impacted by this were Dusk Networks, um, IDEN3, IDEN and then Consensus. And then also there's a caveat here within the blog series that they're specifically talking about a certain version of SnarkJS, um, which was, I think, in their March variant. So if you click this link, it'll show you specifically what that is. And then down here, I have a snapshot from the blog that shows you specifically, or kind of talks through at a high level what the issue is, where um, the prover is able to forge a proof, and they're able to forge a proof because they're able to put in completely random wires or random values um, into those wires that then uh, is computed by a program circuit that the verifier accepts in a blind fashion. This is really saying the same thing. They're saying that the way to, um, to fix this would be to ensure that the verifier handles the um, public inputs in a predefined or agreed upon fashion. Um, but you can see that it basically states that they're not doing that. Instead, they're accepting these in arbitrary public inputs um, from the prover and then they're accepting them. And this is specifically referring to uh, SnarkJS as an example below that to walk you through how it would look like. And then you can see down here that the Planck API is utilizing um, a variant of this proof that's weak to this. So that's kind of the, the issue there is that the prover sends random values into certain wires that are public. And those, those random public values are then sent to a circuit that are the, that's eventually sent to the verifier where the verifier can be duped because they forged a fake proof through these things that are not included within the Shamir transform for this proof. And it's not included in the hash for that, um, for that computation. And here's just a, a silly thing I drew to help myself understand what, what I was saying is that we have our evil prover. They're putting in random values here into the circuit. The circuit then out pops a forged proof. And this forged proof is then gonna have um, the another commitment from, oh, these are private. Oh, this is a bad example. Oh, silly, silly Dylan. All right, so let's ignore, ignore this. Let's say that the verifier evil prover has this public wire here that we're talking about. So this public wire is then modified by us. It's then put in here and it eventually outputs to the verifier who is then tricked. That kind of makes more sense to what I said earlier. All right, and then some resources. So there's a YouTube series from Dave Wong that talks through Planks. I've not watched it, but it is on my list once I get into the Zikari Snark ecosystem. And then also the blog post that I've referred to already um, for the series of Vitalik's posts. If you want to go deep, you can read them all. But my recommendation would be instead of reading everything, I would just read this first you know, portion here and then maybe read this paragraph here and then read this one here if you're excited about it. But anything past that, it gets real complex real fast. So I'd recommend just reading the first couple of paragraphs to get an understanding of how Vitalik conveys um, Planck and how it, how it functions. And with that being stated, that is all of our notes. That's the vulnerability. And uh, here is the repository with all the notes. So hope you enjoyed this. I'll see you in the next video.